Good morning and uh, welcome to each and every one. We are blessed with another beautiful day and we need to rejoice. Uh, our crowd is a little smaller this morning. Uh, a word of caution, we uh, need to remind uh, ourselves uh, to be very cautious and follow the rules uh, or the advice of CDC how to protect ourselves and uh, not become complacent, and that's easy to do, and I've been guilty of that, of uh, getting out of the car and not having my mask on, so uh, be, be cautious about that. One other word of caution, the allergy season is going on, and there's a lot of confusion, and, and you don't know if you have the allergies plus the uh, COVA or not, so if you end up with the allergies, uh, be cautious about that as, as well. I know several people that have uh, come down with the COVA. Uh, they were exposed at school and uh, a, lot of, a lot of complications, but they have recovered. A uh, few announcements this morning. Uh, uh, let's remember uh, Debbie uh, Gibbs' family and Debbie's uncle, uh, guy Ho uh, Hooper, passed away uh, suddenly last week. We also need to remember uh, uh, the Cox family, Sherry uh, Pittman, uh, mother of Samantha, passed away on Thursday, so we need to keep these families in, in our prayers. Also, Chuck Begno uh, has been diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer and will be going to Birmingham this week uh, to uh, meet with his uh, physicians. Other announcements, uh, the community outreach uh, for the month of October We'll be collecting items for Pinevale Children Home, so please uh, note those and place the uh, items in the tub in the face uh, in the foyer. This will be a wonderful work for us to do. Uh, if you would like, you may write a check to Pinevale and turn it into the office and they'll get it to the uh, uh, proper place for the food donations. Uh, <clears throat> let's remember our those on our prayer list, uh, the shut-ins and those that are sick, and also our mission work um, as well. We truly have a lot to be thankful for, so let's try, try not to be uh, paralyzed, but also cautious with all that we're dealing with in this difficult time. Let's go to God in prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we are grateful and thankful for the opportunity to assemble this morning to worship you. We pray our worship will be pleasing in your sight. Father, we're also mindful of those that are experiencing illnesses and sickness and those that have lost loved ones. We pray your hand of comfort for those. Help us to assist in any way that we can and to keep them in our prayers. Father, we also ask that you heal this country, that you provide a solution for this uh, COVA virus that we are contending with. We uh, are struggling with this, and we pray that there will be relief uh, soon. Father, we also ask your blessings on all of our mission projects, and we thank you for those opportunities to spread your word and bring others to you. Father, we are thankful for your power and your knowledge, your power in particular to forgive us of our sins. And Father, when we fall, help us to have penitent hearts and a pure heart and to arise and continue on in the way of your uh, directions in your holy word. Father, as we uh, approach uh, this time this morning, uh, help us to prepare our minds for commemoration of your son's death and resurrection and we are grateful for his sacrifice and for the resurrection for all of our sins and father we pray that we will examine ourselves to ensure that we are participating in the appropriate way father we continue to pray for your grace and mercy and your love is our prayer in your son's holy and merciful name amen
Well, as you see, we did not have an overhead, so we're going to sing two songs that everybody should know. God is so good, and then the invitation song will be trust and obey. So these should be very simple then. Let us sing. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. He answers prayer. He answers prayer. He answers prayer. He's so good to me. He cares for me. He cares for me. He cares for me. He's so good to me. I love him so. I love him so. I love him so. He's so good to Good morning to 7.4% of the greatest group of people I know in Mississippi. <laughs> Our crowd is a little slimmer this morning. I think that probably has something to do with folks trying to be cautious. And the fact that we had to send out word that we indeed did have one person that was at the late service last week that was infected. But as far as we know, no one else at the congregation were impacted by that. We're just trying to be safe and to keep everybody's health as our foremost concern as we strive to get back together regularly and consistently to worship the Lord. Today we're going to discuss a topic that I believe is as imperative as it's ever been, maybe even more so. You know, we look around at our religious world and we see that there is so much division. That's the circumstance that isn't new because the restoration movement came out of that division as Alexander and Thomas Campbell and Barton Stone and others of their time looked and saw all of the division and read in scripture about one church that worshiped the Lord, even with their weaknesses and disagreements and struggles, one church that worshiped the Lord in a unified manner as one body. And they said, this isn't right. And they looked to some different passages like John chapter 17, 20 and 21, where Jesus says, my prayer is not for these alone, talking about the disciples, but for those who believe on me through their word. That's every one of us who've ever believed because of what we read in the word of God, that they may be one, even as thou father art in me and I in thee, that they may be one in us so that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And then, of course, we see that passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that really is kind of one of the first instances of what we would call sectarianism or divisions or denominationalism in that we see Paul addressing this problem in verse 10 when he says, I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and there be no divisions among you, but that you may be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now I've been informed concerning you, brethren, that by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each of you is saying, I'm a Paul or I'm a Paulus or I'm a Cephas or I'm of Christ. And so there we see this first example of hyphenated Christianity. You understand what I mean by that? When you put a hyphen between two words to conjoin them, that's what they're doing. It'd be just like if someone asked you, well, what kind of Christian are you? And, I, and you said, I'm a Church of Christ Christian. There would be an implied hyphen between the words Church of Christ 
and Christian, which implies there are indeed different types. Isn't that right? That's what it implies. So what they're doing, and you can kind of translate this into our current context, what they're doing is they're saying, well, yes, we're all Christians, but we're all different kind of Christians, and no offense, but my kind is better than your kind. You're a Cephas hyphen Christian. You're an Apollos hyphen Christian. You're a Paul hyphen Christian, but I'm a Christ hyphen Christian. That's a better kind. Paul says, no, is Christ divided? And so Campbell and Stone and the founders of the restoration movement in the United States that wanted us to go back and just be that church of the New Testament, they saw that disunity and they said, this does not match with what we see in Scripture. Now, when we look back in that John chapter 17 passage, You'll notice he said, for those who believe on me through their word. I think if we were to determine what are some of the biggest contributors to this disunity at the top of the list would be a misunderstanding or a devaluation of the importance of the word of God. You see, we can't have unity, it says, based upon our faith built upon the apostles' words, if we don't agree that that word is the final authority in all things. And folks, this has been an issue from the very first moments of Christianity to this present time. There are so many great stories of martyrs that have respected, revered, and given their lives for the word of God. Diocletian was a Roman emperor in 303 AD. And his solution to the Christian problem, now many had gone before who tried to wipe out Christianity. Nero had persecuted Christianity. Domitian had persecuted Christianity on a worldwide stage. Marcus Aurelius had tried to wipe out Christianity. Now Diocletian comes along and he says, I can't, no one seems to be able to wipe them out. So I'm going to wipe out the source. I'm going to wipe out their scriptures. I'm going to wipe out their Bible. So he made a decree that every Christian could keep practicing Christianity and would not be persecuted, tormented, arrested, or killed if they just turned over their scriptures. And many of the local magistrates, they had a kind of a loose policy on it. You know, just give them a few sheets of loose papyrus or vellum with some scripture, Christian scripture on it. And they, they'd say, that's good. You didn't even have to turn in everything you had. They didn't enforce it all that strictly. But there was a elder in a church outside of Carthage in North Africa named Felix. And they came to him and they said, we know you have some scripture, turn it in. And it's kind of like a wink, wink, turn in a page or two. He said, I won't even give you a page. And he was carried back to Italy and he was killed because he wouldn't even turn over a scrap of the scriptures that he had. Because he said, these are my life. And without them, I don't have a life. You see, that's an understanding of the imperative, of the importance, of the vital nature of the Word of God. It's still an issue. It hasn't been very many years ago that I was in graduate school in one of our brotherhood co colleges. And I got an Old Testament history course and we were studying through things in Solomon's writings, or so I'd always believed Solomon's writings. We get to Ecclesiastes, and I couldn't believe what was being presented to me. It's called textual historical criticism, where they're trying to compare the Bible with other ancient writings. And guess what? When the Bible doesn't match up to other ancient writings, they assume that the Bible's wrong and not those other writings. And it frustrated me to no end. So finally, in the final paper of the course, we were told to write about the authorship of the book of Ecclesiastes and the identity of Quohelet. That's translated in your Bible as the preacher. The identity of Quohelet. 
So I worked and worked and wrote what I believe still to be a masterpiece defense of the Solomonic authorship of the book of Ecclesiastes. And I got a C. And basically all the professor said is, well, this wasn't argued well. Give me an A on everything else that I worked half as hard on. And so here we have the word of God attacked even in religious, even in our own religious institutions. Folks, we need to be a people who sing the old song again. I should have got together with Troy and sang this. We would have known it as well. Give me the Bible. Star of gladness gleaming. Because the word of God is useful. What does Paul say to Timothy? For teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped unto every good work. Some versions say perfectly equipped unto every good work. So, isn't it safe to assume that all this disunity in Scripture, the first step to solve the problem of disunity would be to solve the problem of how people see the scriptures. Because a great many, even religious people, deny the all-sufficiency of the scriptures, of the word of God. We don't have to look very far to point out that this is true. To the traditions and the rituals of mankind that they hold as dear as the scriptures themselves. We could look in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 9 where it says, Do not call anyone on this earth your father. For one is your father, he who is in heaven. But yet religious groups, because of tradition, because of their, their background, their rituals, they call men father and revere them in a way that only God should be revered. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits, doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving. Some require today still celibacy. Some say you can eat this and you can't eat that. But what about what the scriptures say? What's the final authority? We look and we examine places like Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, verses 39 through 40. Where it says, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. The Spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and he showed them his feet. Yet some who are religious today deny that Jesus was bodily resurrected. It's just a spiritual, metaphorical thing. How can you believe that and still revere the scriptures as the final authority? And then 1 Corinthians 14, 34 through 37, let the women keep silent in the churches. They're not permitted to speak, but must be submissive. And then 1 Timothy chapter 2, and I simply use that to illustrate, and this could be applied to things like what kind of marriages and gender relationships and so many other things where our society is trying to change it to what's acceptable today rather than what the word of God teaches is God's desire. See, folks see the scriptures as pliable, as flexible, as able to be used to support whatever they deem to be right and moral and good. But we read with such severity things like Galatians chapter 1, where Paul says, even if I or an angel from heaven come and give you a different gospel, don't believe it. The scriptures themselves tell us of their own self-sufficiency. In Acts 20, verse 27, it says, For I have not shunned to declare to you 
the whole counsel of God. And then verse 32 of Acts 20. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. He said, I've given you the whole counsel of God. We have everything we need. What does he say there? To build us up and to give us an inheritance. Everything we need. And then, of course, we look in places like Second Peter chapter one, verse three, as he says, as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. In Jude verse three, he says, contend ye earnestly for the faith once for all delivered. And of course, as we mentioned in the beginning of our lesson, second Timothy three, 16 and 17, all scripture is God breathed. Some versions say given by inspiration and useful for teaching, rebuking, and training in righteousness. Then a man of God may be perfectly, thoroughly equipped unto every good work. The word of God has everything we need. It must be the final and only standard for all of life. For what we do, for what we say, for how we worship for how we live, for how we parent, for what kind of spouse we are, for what kind of employee we are, for what kind of employer we are. It has all we need for life and godliness. These ancient words are special, not because of their poetic beauty. I read a lot of things by a lot of folks. And some of them are quite impressive, and I'll pour back over them again. But there's a difference. When I read from Shakespeare, or when I read from Homer, or when I read from Aristotle, or when I read from great philosophers, whoever it may be, because however wise they are, it's still the wisdom of men. But if the Bible is what it claims to be, and I would say, if, it, if you don't think that it is, then why are you wasting your time as a Christian? Because that's what it is. If the Bible, if every word of the Bible is not true, then this is the most colossal waste of time. Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 15, when he's talking about the resurrected Christ, he said, if Christ isn't resurrected, let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. He says, the hedonists have it right. If the Bible isn't true, if Jesus is still in the ground, then we need to just have as much fun as we can have because this is all we've got. And then he says, if he isn't resurrected, we of all men are most to be pitied. Don't waste your time in Christianity if you don't believe the Bible is true. But if you do, every word, then let's all work and I'll tell you, we'll have unity if we all submit wholly and completely to the word of God. This morning, if you need to submit your life to the word of God, perhaps you'd not come to him. It's a simple process. It's a faith process. Believing in his name and repenting of your sins being baptized for the remission of those sins and before and then after all your life confessing Him as your Lord proudly to all mankind. If you haven't done so, then come right now as we stand and as we sing. When we walk with the Lord He the light of His Word what a glory we shed on our way while we do its good will he abides with us still and with all who can trust and obey trust and Trust and obey. Then it
and fellowship sweet. We will sit at His feet, or we'll walk by His side in the way. What He said we will do, where He sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. We have the privilege of gathering together to worship on the first day of the week. Some, in fact, more than usual, will be joining us uh, by virtual means today. But however we are able to come together, it indeed is a privilege. When I was growing up as a young preacher type, and even as a young man before that, one of my favorite preachers was Batsel Barrett Baxter. He was a good one. And Brother Baxter once said that worship is the most important, yet at the same time the most difficult experience in the Christian's life. So think about that for just a moment. There are some of us and maybe all of us at times who are more like we're coming for the service and not for the worship if that makes sense and we did not properly prepare ourselves before we came and we did not police our mind once we were here and that responsibility is on us In the Old Testament, after David's sin with Bathsheba, he was exposed and then repentance and forgiveness followed. And the Bible says in 2 Samuel 12 verse 20, and David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself, changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. He realized that's what he needed. He needed to approach God on God's terms once again. That was the rest of the cycle of his repentance. And I would urge us that when we have grievous sin in our life, do not quit. Does no good to go on a guilt trip if that's where the story ends. We need to confess our sins and worship if we have qualified ourselves to worship. And those of us who are of the age of accountability, as Carrie just said, qualify ourselves by becoming New Testament Christians. And by the way, some cannot properly worship because they've not come to grips with their sin. And though they may be Christians, have not poured out their hearts in genuine repentance. So because I want to instigate and maintain this relationship with God, I want to value worship. And yet most of what amounts to our worship has come by observation, imitation, and experience. And we may be one of the few congregations around that's given specific time at length to study worship. And that's good, but we must not let up on that. When Job learned that everything he had basically was gone, his health, his wealth, his family, his standing in the community, 
The Bible says in Job 1 and verse 20, Then Job arose, tore his mantle, shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. And to me that signals unqualified, unquestioned acceptance of the will of God. That sometimes bad things do happen to good people. And sometimes people are not able to accept the circumstances in their lives, it seems, and it makes them bitter, not better. And they blame God for their problems. But in addition to the privilege of worship is the necessity of worship from my seat, from your seat. The worship of acceptance says that God is, God is in charge, God knows what's best for me. And whatever circumstance comes my way, God is good. Whatever happens to me, I will worship God. And so we come to that part of our worship that we may call the Lord's Supper, we may call it communion. Whatever you call it, we need to approach it carefully and thoughtfully. In 1 Peter 3 and verse 18, the Bible says that Christ also once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. And that's what we want to remember at this time, that great sacrifice that was made. Would you bow with me, please? Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this privilege of worship. We are thankful that you have provided this wonderful means of drawing closer to you, have access to you. We're thankful for this bread, which represents the body of Jesus, where he sacrificed that body for us and his earthly life for us. Help us be thoughtful and approved in your sight as we participate. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful unto you that by the blood of Jesus, we are accepted in your sight. We look forward to the day when that plan will have its ultimate fulfillment when we can be with you eternally. We're thankful that Jesus shed his blood. We're thankful we can access that blood and being baptized into Christ. And we're thankful that we can come to remember that blood. Thank you for this remembrance. In Christ's name we pray, amen. This concludes our time together today. As you leave, you have the opportunity to complete your worship with your contribution if you hadn't already made arrangements to do that. And we thank you for your presence, whether it be real or virtual. And let's go to God in a prayer of dismissal. Our Father, we're thankful that we can gather today to worship you to hear a lesson from your word, to have Christian fellowship, to be made stronger. Help each of us to be who you would have us be this week. Thank you for loving us and taking care of us. In Christ's name we pray, amen.